of London. Formally, Paul Hamilton, uh, Paul Hamilton had taught at Oxford for 15 years and then at Southampton. Uh, he has published widely on Romanticism and literary theory. His most recent books are Meta-Romanticism, Aesthetics, Literature, Theory, Coleridge and German Philosophy, The Poet and the Land of Logic, and Real Poetic, European Romanticism and Literary Politics. Some handouts. It's about 40. It's 27 and 35. So just over, just over. Okay. Um, in English Romanticism, can you hear me? Just say if you can. I'm pretty soft. In English Romanticism. Coleridge and Crabbe Robinson aside, there was little awareness of the way continental philosophy and literature shaped itself with ingenuity and versatility in response to Kant's critiques. So here I'm going to make a Hegelian wager that philosophically unselfconscious English writing was still arguably reflective of its epoch and configured itself accordingly. And this premise allows me to risk some Anglo-German comparisons directed by main reactions to Kant. These, of course, are endless, so after 35 minutes, I think I'll just stop. <laughs> um, Friedrich Schlegel thought that post-Kantianism really began after Fichte. Fichte, according to the Athenaeum Fragmente, was a Kant raised to the second power. And indeed, Fichte might not have disagreed with Schlegel's description. Only when one saw the pervasiveness of Fichte's critical position, could one grasp, wrote Schlegel, the identity of his philosophy with Kant. That's the 281 in the Athenaeum fragments. Fichte had little or nothing to say about liter literature and aesthetics. The academic character of his philosophy was what post-Kantianism broke down, and in so doing it expanded considerably our sense of the ways in which other discourses could themselves philosophize. In the first reaction to Kant, the critique of judgment was taken to show that the critical philosophy could be turned into a phenomenology. Kant's dialectic was now internalized within his analytic. The unbedingte ceased to be an ineffable realm whose cooperation with the one we knew and inhabited we had to assume. Instead, it was phenomenally characterized in examples as different as Schlegel's infinite irony or Hegel's logic. Ultimately, this perhaps explains the quite extraordinary capacity of romantic writing, um, sketched by Byron Zondjuan, and perhaps achieved in Goethe's Faust, to describe almost any philosophical position as an experience. Schlegel's irony refused speculation about an ineffable Ding an sich, and instead found in the conceptual transitions required by the relativism of our knowledge an experience of absolute reality. This is a very Benjamin inflected reading of Schlegel, I admit. That reality was not postponed or infinitely deferred to some ideal realm, but was intermittently available in our apprehension of the incompleteness of any version of the world. The fragment became the form of universal philosophy, but in its fragmentariness was itself an, obje an object of experience. Like a hedgehog, an eagle, the individuality which denied it general jurisdiction let us experience what it was not more sharply. Like Hegel's inverted world in his phenomenology, its pointed resistance to displacement gave us memorably the outline of the being of everything around it. Hegel, of course, saw this solution as one stage in the way to a better enlightenment. Schlegel, though, appears to insist that if we get the absolute and the experience of fragmentariness, and this is repeatedly accessible, then progress is not the advancing movement of Hegel's recursive phenomenology, but is a lateral stretch across different genre or ways of inversely experiencing the absolute. He called virtuosity in these generic variations poesie, and to find the poetry in everything gave us a progressive, because continual, not better, experience of the universal. In his aesthetics, Hegel consistently argued that once we saw that the significance of art was to give us this experience, then we could dispense with the experience and just make do with the significance, or replace art with the philosophy of art. For Schlegel and Byron, though, the experience 
could not be dissolved in its philosophy in this way. After all, it was the experience of everything. Now, you've got, got a handout. I'm not going to read bits from the handout. I'll just refer to the numbers, which I hope I've got right. Um, so this, uh, you should be looking at number one. Byron famously commended his great poem Don Juan to his friend Douglas Kinnaird and indirectly to his publisher John Murray, who was running scared, by joshing him into admitting it was the thing. Now, Kantian and post-Kantian philosophy could perhaps not be further from Byron's mind in this letter. He's describing the poem's range in terms of erotic license, likening its engagingness to, if one is honest, the ubiquitousness of lust as no respecter of place, time, or persons. The comedy is the usual one, of le méconique claqué sur le vivant, as Byron styles his poem as grabbing our attention with the compulsiveness of sex. Thing, yes, is a pun in the way it is in Hamlet's speech to Ophelia. I'll spare you Byron's colourful demotic in the rest of the letter, but what is being figured is the representativeness of the hero of his poem, Don Juan. Byron's poem is not ostensibly about philosophy. In fact, it is about cutting through any abstract pretensions which distract from the real. But maybe it really is about philosophy, a philosophy as it applies to our doggy nature, go on you dog, to man as kunikos, the philosophy that is, of the cynics. Everything is public, everything is in the marketplace, there's no privacy, no depth. But this philosophy of surfaces is meant to gain in freedom from inhibition what it loses in depth. Cynicism brings together the public and private uses of reason which Kant's idea of enlightenment try to keep apart. Cynicism is an anti-Kantian position. Like an opposite delight in mortification of the flesh, cynicism, writes Kant in his anthropology, being forsaken by the graces, can make no claim to humanity. To think that it did would be to adopt what Kant calls a distorted form of virtue, and so, in terms of Kantian ethics, to propose a different kind of universal. Why doesn't Kant just call cynicism a capitulation to the hegemony of our senses, the, their hegemony over our reason, or what is universally valid for all human beings? Well, perhaps because he knows it promulgates a challenger, another universal, disreputable, maybe, but the real thing. Don Juan's eroticism sounds entirely male, but his hero is much more imposed on than imposing and very unlike Mozart's libertarian libertine, Don Giovanni. Don Juan is, in other words, a stand-in for our receptivity to experience as such, and that receptivity takes over from the Bildungsroman format, which Byron might have been expected to follow. Correlatively, the Ottava Rima stanza foregrounds its own capaciousness, and its rhymes become a device to group high and low, or any distinctive registers that are usually kept apart. Byron described the poem as Montaigne's essays, with Tristram Shandy for a hinge, as Jim knows. He wants to know what he knows, following Montaigne's motto, but that knowledge can only be pursued ironically, through diversion, digression, transport, all the resources of a style eschewing both monumentality and progress to rejoice in the sheer mobility redolent of Stern. That is, he turns insolvable philosophical positions into their own experience. Doubt becomes a definite experience without, though, resolving the philosophical conundrum it posits. If you look at two, I will read this. Que was the mon motto of Montaigne and also of the first academicians, that all is dubious which man may attain was one of their most favourite positions. There's no such thing as certainty. That's plain as any of mortality's conditions. So little do we know what we're about in this world. I doubt if doubt itself be doubting. Don Juan carves out a huge horseshoe of a journey, starting in Spain, taking in the Greek islands and the way to Turkey, a temporary resting place before continuing to Russia, from which the narrative loops back to England. When the poem begins very much, while the poem begins very much in domestic squabbles, literary and political, it sets up expectations that it will describe a Europe alternative to the one to be mapped out at the Congress of Vienna, beginning in 1814, and the congresses that came after, all of which appear dedicated to enforcing the geography decided on at Vienna. 
In this, it follows the example of Novalis, the Christenheit oder Europa, and then of Friedrich Schlegel, who posited his non-Napoleonic Europe in his post-Athenaeum journal, also named Europa. Or you have Madame de Stael, whose cultural journalism and travelogues again recorded her own journeys through Europe, eventually in exile, one step of Napoleon's invasion, but effectively welcoming countries such as Germany, and then after, after um, 1815, Italy like a cultural ambassador, welcoming them to the Europe of Nations. Schlegel is a secretary on Metternich's side at the Congress, but his sketches of a German constitution, a Verfassung, show that he was still attached to his own figurations of a European unity cast in transnational terms. Our participation in something like a refiguration in musical harmonics of the Holy Roman Empire. The power to refigure one's belonging appears as much the guarantee of cohesion as the actual poverty envisaged. These efforts recover and rework Burke's nostalgia for unity, variously cast as chivalry or an historical mortman, joining us with the past, an inalienable inheritance, rather like the lingua latina with which Novalis's romanticizing of the world culminates. In keeping, Byron's dedication to Don Juan excoriates the British Foreign Minister at the Congress of Vienna, Robert Stuart Lord Castlereagh, who largely went along with the plans of Metternich, and therefore Francis I of Austria, and those of Tsar Alexander and Frederick William III of Prussia. Byron's narrator is still railing against Alexander and the Holy Three in Canto 14, and against Wellington's wasting of the post-Napoleonic opportunity of reform, Canto 9. Byron explicitly compares Castlereagh's linguistic failings as an orator with his own writing. Political differences and style are bound together. Byron's alternative to Napoleonic Imperium is also an obvious sequel to his descriptions of Napoleon and his Waterloo in Canto II of the earlier poem, Charles Harold's Pilgrimage. Comparably to Styles' rehabilitations, literary rehabilitations of Italy, these things fo which follow in Canto three, but, but the main point I want to make is that Byron then moves from politics to metaphysics in Don Juan without an obvious effort of abstraction, but through a mobility of style. His language generally supports um, the, what he shows to be in a chauvinistic age, a kind of tolerance which has been forgotten, a tolerance generally and it's this, I think, which begins to shade from politics into metaphysics and becomes, um, and this is the risky bit, a kind of phenomenological succession to Kant. Don Juan is unfinished. Its concluding cantos are known as the English cantos. The remapping of Europe, the project he shared with Schlegel, Stahl and the others, appears to be given up. Now he's competing with a novel in English, surely, with Austen and Scott. Um, I think Scott won that battle. There is a pian to Scott at one point, but the European connection is actually preserved in the metaphysical assumption that the increase in reflexivity, the poetry of poetry, turns out to be the road to the thing. When the narrative gets back to England, the narrator has to think hard about what the poem is now for. This leads to ruminations on aesthetics and the nature of his writing. And these reflections turn out to generate a sense of the intentionality of all experience, that the world understood delivers back to us an experience of our mode of experiencing it. This reflexivity does not produce abstractions, but the opposite, the collapse of philosophy into experience. The philosophical content lies in the fact that the formal virtuosity and mixing genre in one poem, as opposed to the famous mixed metaphors of Castlereagh, gets us closer to the truth of things through its ability once more to deal with everything. Most writing on, on romantic irony um, in, in literary matters concentrates on this inseparability of truth from fri fiction. And Byron certainly is an adept of that, that pursuit. In Canto 8 he writes, but then the facts are fact, and tis the part of a true poet to escape from fiction where'er he can. Meaning, with the ironists, that the poet expert in fiction is conscious of the artifice of knowledge, and so endeavours through an especial creativity to imagine an unillusioned, imagine, uh, an unillusioned apprehension of this condition, one itself without fiction. That he cannot is no doubt what Schlegel would call the irony 
of irony, but treated without pretensions to escaping it philosophically. The dilemma of being caught theoretically by your own tail wherever you go expands enormously the range of a poetry now licensed to find its material wherever it goes. My point is that Byron is more interested in this poetic enfranchisement than in the paradoxes of irony. Experience becomes the experience of poetry or the impossibility of escaping from fiction. And to show this truth, poetry has to give up on grasping truth systematically and do so informally, evinced in that detached, unhierarchical attitude towards its own genre that makes for comedy. The catalogue of experience is funny because, high and low, experience has the same poetic char character. The Gothic thriller, he writes at the end of Don Juan, reaffirms this theme that the unserious, in the unserious there is more chance of catching the universal. When the loud shriek of Minerva's fowl rattles round me her discordant hymn. The humour throughout makes the philosophy casual rather than professional, and so in Schlegelian terms, more likely to release results. Casual philosophy is a kind of cynicism, and here we're again taking up the language of the cynics with which the young Schlegel in his fragments like to play with. Byron's casualness, though, tries to be cynical even about Diogenes. To be nor Diogenes, um, in the longer quotation from, from Don Juan on the handout, to be nor even Diogenes is on his own terms, of course, to surpass Diogenes. Or put another way, he cynically views cynicism as simply one other way of accessing still more experience. And reciprocally, he views the acquiring of more experience as the renovation of poetry. Get rid of standards of all kinds, and through poetry, the world becomes indiscriminately available as never before. At the end of Canto 17, he leaves his unfinished poem by returning to the thing. I leave the thing a problem, like all things. His grand poetic riddle preserves this uncertainty. Every extreme is an opportunity. Cuvier's catastrophic theory of all the worlds before meshes again with a cynical conclusion when Byron writes, men are but maggots of some huge earth's burial. Men are but maggots of some huge earth's burial. Debasement is the continuation of experience by other means. The phenomenology gets a bit precarious here, but only through Byron's ambitions of extending it and here conjuring the idea of living in another world, but the cynicism ensures that this world could not be less otherworldly. In this way it scandalously collapses any ennobling noumenal vocation into the most basic of phenomenologies. In another move towards a comprehensiveness of experience, surpassing Kant's transcendental deduction, Schlegel analogously identifies cynicism rather than, as more, more usual, stoicism with Christianity, preferring nature to art, despising every economic standard and political pomp. That's Athenaeum Fragment 16. Less provocatively, but I think still in keeping, is the letter Goethe's remark, beloved by Walter Benjamin, that there is a, de and this is um, number six, there is a delicate empiricism which so intimately involves itself with the object that it becomes true theory. This increase in mental capacity, however, belongs to a highly cultivated period. Fichte, arguably, would have seen this as exemplifying that misunderstanding of Kant, which lets people think they can, I'm quoting from the first introduction to the Wissenschaftslehrer, rid themselves of all serious speculation and go on cultivating their superficial empiricism. In opposition to Fichte, Goethe sounds explicitly post-Kantian, enjoying a post schillerian easiness with speculation free of the ideas, rational or aesthetic, from which different kinds of experience have to be deducible in the Kantian tradition. Now the object makes itself accessible through an empiricism or experience too sensitive to the object to be different from it. If this sounds too polite to connect with Byron, whose unbridled temperament and lack of moral restraint Goethe deplored, we should nevertheless note that it does offer an explanation of Goethe's mixed remarks upon Byron, the, the greatest genius of our century, according to Eckermann. Goethe's Byron, you'll remember, is Shakespeare's equal in apprehending objects and penetrating past situations, but he is only great as a poet. 
When he reflects, he is a child. Byron lived, said Goethe, in a state of nature. But the greatness of the poetry seems to be an adequacy to objects which, like a cynical philosopher, replaces reflection with the experience of living in nature. An intimacy with objects itself takes on a theory and takes theory beyond its traditional boundaries. For thinking about for thinking about Don Juan, Goethe is moved to say to, to Eckermann, I think this is number four, and that our German aesthetical people are always talking about poetical and unpoetical objects. And in one respect, they're not quite wrong. Yet at bottom, no real object is unpoetical if the poet knows how to use it properly. That's after talking about Don Juan. Mm. It is the poetic use of the object that produces the aesthetic here, not the other way around. Byron, thinks Goethe, should have turned on critics of his obscenity and reduced them to asking the single question of whether he'd made a right use of his material. And this, we might say, is cynical in a way which connects the classical and the modern senses of the world, the philosophical and the opportunistic. Just because it is the discourse which can be about everything, poetry can be validated whatever it is about. Right. Um, on to the second reaction. In the second reaction that I'm hazarding, um, critique becomes crisis. Those who could not feel phenomenologically empowered or confident to the extent outlined above staged expressive dilemmas as apparently different as Wordsworth's Godwin crisis in The Borderers and Heinrich von Kleist's Kant-Krise. The persistently unassimilable status of Kant's unconditioned ground of everything becomes what writing is about, as self-difference becomes the disabled transcendental category which speculation cannot do without. Time is the form of inner sense for Kant, the form that is of the intuition of our self and inner state. I've, um, again, some Kant quotation on the hand that. But as soon as understanding grasps the object of inner sense, Schiller tells us in the first of his aesthetic letters, it destroys it. According to Martin Hagelund's recent book on Derrida, time is also the form of Derrida's idea of difference. Derrida then might provide a useful contrast, slightly unusual one, with how the post-Kantians revised Kant and tried to solve the paradox of perceiving a subjectivity located in a perception. The project of the aesthetic letters is to salvage self-consciousness both from its cancellation by conceptual understanding and from the abstraction of the transcendental logic in which it is grounded. This intangible, after all, is also our self-acquaintance, the, the most familiar and continual of our apprehensions, isn't it? The problem seems to be one of philosophy's own making. However, time itself, the form in which we intuit ourselves, has traditionally seemed quite capable of its own deconstruction. Again, Augustine's classic formulation describes the most common knowledge disappearing under philosophical examination. Derrida's way out of the Kantian difficulty of defining self-consciousness is to dispense altogether with the idea of self-presence. Instead, we'll make do with the form in which things make sense. Then the impossibility of being present to oneself, which seemed peculiar to self-consciousness, can be seen to be a general condition under which everything labours. The meaning of a word once more vanishes as we home in on it to be replaced by the empty spacing of the word in the language or its differences from other words, its traces of them. But this theory of meaning is simultaneously a philosophy of time. That is the essence of grammatology and explains its core assimilation of meaning and time, crucially not being in time, in the idea of difference, which combines differing with deferral. Time, time clearly is and is not because the temporal points for triangulating the present are themselves in need of the same triangulation and so are equally insubstantial in themselves. To understand time is like St. Augustine to understand that we cannot truly say that time is only because it is tending not to be. Non veri dicamus tempus esse in isi quia tendit non esse. Spacing is for Derrida, Hagelund tells us, the condition of everything that can be thought or desired. 
It is therefore analogous to Kant's transcendental unity of apperception, the I think, which must be able to accompany every experience, guaranteeing its status as experience through belonging to a self which never appears and so is a constant impervious to the differences between experiences. The self-sufficiency of Derrida's spacing, though, is what does away with the need for this transcendental signified, which would lock the spatial grid in place and evoke a consistency of meaning. Without Kantian metaphysics, and so ultra-transcendental, the spatial metaphor suggests there is nothing to stop spacing from stretching, bending, being uneven, and doing everything which prevents us from being dogmatic about meanings. So fluid and playful a structure cultivates an exemplary phenomenology, one open to the future implication of any meaning in its opposite. Romantics, like uh, Kleist, also like Leopardi, are more interested in the unmanageability and excruciating embarrassment of the positions into which their analogous exploitation of the possible disconnect between transcendental and empirical makes available. Kant's transcendental reasoning depends on the idea that for us it is necessary to assume its fit with our sublunary world, our experience. Leopardi and Kleist are also ultra-transcendental in their documenting of a human tendency to think outside this fit and imagine what is beyond it. They review experience in its tragic or chaotic character as suggesting more of this antinomianism than the mutual dependency of transcendental and empirical on which Kant's argument relies. While Derrida, in his attack on pure self-identity, gets us to see the logic of contamination, the futuristic self-differing needed to make meaning possible, life is mortality, and so on, for our two romantics and others like them, this living on is not a superior critique, but a perpetual crisis. Um, let me suggest some examples. Rivers the villain of Wordsworth's tragedy, The Borderers, is usually thought to be the vehicle of Wordsworth's critique of the ideas of William Godwin's An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice of 1793. Rivers has an old man murdered by proxy in order to initiate another, the murderer, into the unconditioned kind of experience he impossibly lays claim to. Wordsworth, who was initially enthusiastic about Godwin, took from his treatise the idea that reason was the supreme organ of truth. Transcending local detail and circumstance, abstract reason, if followed meticulously, would necessarily lead to perfection. Wordsworth's later disillusion with this rational optimism grew from the neglect of human feeling in Godwin's argument and the belief that truth referred in this way entirely to reason without any basis in affect would prove merciless. Truth, however, to be complete must be a notion incorporating a place for sympathy and natural feeling. This, though, had been the conclusion that Godwin himself had reached, and his recent reading of David Hume is evident in the second edition of Political Justice, which appeared in 1795, two years later. Hume had thought that reason could never be a motive for action, and that our construction of the external world, our basic epistemology, was founded not on reason but on the power of imagination to generate such ideas as an external world from reflect reflection on the frequency and recurrence of impressions which in themselves had no necessary relation to each other. When Wordsworth expresses his full disillusionment in his drama, The Borderers, however, Wordsworth's critique of Godwin's rational contempt for conventional sentiment and his subsequent tempering of it by concessions to natural feeling has become something different. In other words, reason's departure from feeling has become the idea that if we, impossibly for Kant, adhere to pure reason, we would become an entirely different kind of creature. But why should that new existence not be benign? Its transcendence of ordinary feeling does not necessarily promise brutality. In other words, instead of Kant's switch from making space for the supersensible to imagining a superhuman being for whom the sublime is not contraproposive but beautiful, and who can use a nature as a schema for reason in the critic of judgment, one must postulate an actively antagonistic character emerging from rational enfranchisement. This, it seems to me, is not to be understood in relation to Godwin whom, as Stephen Gill says, Wordsworth is grossly simplifying, but a different kind of economy of thought. What is at stake in the language of the borderers is a kind of greatness, not the evils of abstract reason. The new area of self-definition into which the villain Rivers wanders is totally free of conceptual and ethical prescription, and so is also totally arbitrary. 
the purer element in which he exists beyond the visible barriers of the world is antinomian. The practical experiments he undertakes in this condition are not intentionally brutal, they're just a category mistake, an, an attempt to claim the authority to match a world beyond phenomena to the phenomenal world we experience. We therefore never get the purer element intended and can only see the actions of an unfeeling empiric. It is like Penthesilea's love for Achilles, so extraordinary, recht von Herzen, that quite out of her control it produces dismemberment as famously Cusa turned into Bissa, explicable to herself only as rhyme, not as meaning, das reint sich, she says. River's murderous greatness is more like that, rhymes with Penthesilea, if you like, and is much less explicable as a chastisement of the rational ambitions of Godwin's philosophy. If we belong to a category of being beyond our jurisdiction, it may not be enough to manage this discovery by critiquing attempts to go beyond Kant's dialectic of our necessary de jure assumption that what is outside our understanding does not invalidate our understanding. It may de facto impose itself, and then who knows what may ensue. Eight minutes, right. Um, in my third sketch of reactions to Kant, even the, this, the initial enjoyment of the facility of romantic phenomenology with which I ba began, as opposed to the scepticism I've just been talking about, even that initial phenomenal, phenomenology produces a distinctive melancholy, a kind of falling upwards, as Hilderlin put it early on in his fragment on reflection. Man can auch in der Höhe fallen, so wie in der Tiefe. In this scenario, ultimate speculative success can only undo us, uncovering Schelling's Ungrund, or Shelley's triumph of life, one sad thought. Or in the idiom of recent postmodern pe pessimism, perhaps, their life. I've only time to talk a little about this. Imagine that the broken middle was repaired, that concepts and experience were reconciled, that empiricism was so intimate with its objects so as to have released their theory, or that phenomenology was identical with the thing itself. What would we have? Well, we would have bypassed the subject-object dichotomy with its dialectic of mastery and slavery, a mind presuming to understand a nature, and a nature claiming to be the force generating and explaining mind. One question asked by the post-Kantians, though, is about what it would be like to experience such enfranchisement from traditional epistemological vying for ascendancy of one pole over another. Would it be an enrichment, the solution of a problem, a fulfillment, or would it be a fall into a dangerous indifference, a loss of identity, an unmanageable increase? In Schelling's Freiheitsschrift, we unpick our inherited limitations at our peril or at least in post-Freudian updatings, we return to something which appears original, but could only have been constructed retrospectively. What appears then, like an overcoming of limitations, is actually the creation of limitations, but paradoxically in the shape of their overcoming. Schelling used Christian discourse to describe the paradox which Zizek puts in Lacanian terms. Discontent with our manageable dispensation is not ambition, but a refusal of God's love. Shelling. Yearning for an escape from the symbolic system bespeaks an immature failure to realize that identity requires linguistic containment equivalent to Oedipal restraints. Zizek. These discussions are largely technical in their purview, but in keeping with the foregoing discussion, there is a post-Kantian interest in the quality of experience in this Weltanschauung. What seems to be different in romantic thinking's discovery of this possibility is that it phenomenalize, pheno I can't say this, phenomenologizes what it is like to confront an unlimited but self-annihilating capacity and refuse that reversal. To think you could manage it would be sublimity or something. With its insatiable appetite for turning any form of reflexivity into an experience, romantic writing can address what it's like to make just that self-limiting choice. And this, if you like, is the truth content of Schelling's undoctrinal use of theological language about God and the devil, light and darkness, and so on in the Freiheitsschrift. But I want to think briefly, um, going back to one of my hazardous comparisons, finish on this, about Shelley's The Triumph of Life. 
Triumph of Life, Shelley's final poem, in the form of a Petrarchan triumph, confronts head-on the unmediated source of our living, life, as though distinguishable from living. This is indeed a phenomenology that has grown foreign. The medium in which we live and move and have our being drags us along in triumph behind its car. In the context of this kind of discussion, though, the issue is not really what life is, whether it's primary or second nature, biology or culture, bios or zoe. Not at stake is whether this is an inauthentic rather than an authentic life, a social babble rather than the language of men. Rather, it is the fact that we can take up a stance towards our own immediacy, look at our living and find that difference from it which makes it an experience. The triumph of life is defeated by the power to talk about it, a power which cannot be included in it. Kant's aperceptive category, the, the condition of perception which is never a perception itself, is revived but turned into an experience. And so two quick supporting points. The narrator of Shelley's contemporary medieval dream allegory is a figure called Rousseau, whose dilapidated state testifies to life's triumph and whose commentary, just because it is a commentary, testifies to an escape from it by being able to reflect upon it. However, and this is the rub, the escape from life is also our alienation from it because we cannot understand life other than as something to which we should belong. The triumph of life, therefore, records the phenomenology of an unhappy consciousness, one whose freedom from bondage is also a longing for participation and satisfaction. This is done in terms of the heart. While Penthesilea's Herz was the word for crisis, or the horrific reversal of love as she becomes indistinguishable for her hounds, um, if you look at 10, I, I, won't, I haven't got time to quote it, but now she rages among her dogs and becomes, becomes indistinguishable from them with her slavering lip and so on, and chasing Achilles. But this canine appropriation has none of the provocatively easy openness to experience of the cynic, but is inhuman in a way that is deliberately unassimilable to civilized behavior. Our unhuman could not be more unhuman here. And Shelley's Rousseau too finds that I was overcome by my own heart alone, he uses the word heart, which neither age nor tears nor infamy nor now the tomb could temper to its object. He's fallen by the wayside and that failure is why he can narrate the melancholy story of life's triumph. He's fallen upwards in a sense, gaining his perspective through his debasement, emerging from his absorption in the larger processes of life, to be able to pronounce in a human state divided between what it belongs to and those forces it needs in order to be human. He enters the poem like, like one of Archimbolo's portraits. The narrator says, I would have added, is whole here a miss? But a voice answered, life. I turned anew, oh heaven, have such mercy, so, sorry, have mercy and such wretchedness that what I thought was an old root which grew to strange distortion out of the hillside was indeed one of that deluded crew and that the grass which methought hung so wide and white was but his thin discoloured hair and that the holes it vainly sought to hide were or had been eyes. His is an image of corruption, we're later told, but it remains the case that this degeneracy this wretchedness supplies the viewpoint from which Rousseau can see that those enthralled to life are the wise, the great, the unforgotten. There's no Nietzschean overcoming of this condition. Those who do escape life fled back like eagles to their native noon, and so are not in life anymore. Their authority, grown divine, are too good for this world. Those who can gain a perspective on the all-encompassing category, though, like Rousseau, do appear to settle for the desert of Derrida's autoimmunity, a materialism vastly sympathetic to human failure because human success is dysfunctional. To understand life then becomes like putting everything on a beam as the deconstructionist manifesto's use of the poem The Triumph of Life did in deconstruction and criticism in the early 80s, or was it the late 70s? However, Shelley's Rousseau, in addition, gives us the Lucretian colour of the experience of this kind of living on, or better, he has the romantic habit of reminding us that every philosophical position generates an experience of itself outside its own claims, either to theoretical mastery or intellectual abnegation, an experience asking for its own language. Claims for the transcendental status or otherwise of these standpoints defer to the experience of it. 
described by Byron and Shelley in their different ways. Cynical, the capital C, and cynical with a small c. For Romanticism, the thing is what challenges our honesty to admit that, as philosophical commentators in Romanticism, there's always a style in any philosophizing, and we're responsible for that as much as for the coherence of our reasoning. <laughs>